Hi everybody, it's Mike Kennedy, Vermont Bar Council. Welcome to my garage or maybe back to my garage if you've seen one of these before. If you haven't, I've been doing a series of CLEs from the garage during the coronavirus pandemic. On that, I hope everybody's staying healthy and safe, being good to each other, being good to yourselves. This has been a process today, this particular CLE. I think this is my fourth time. The first time it got way too complicated. It's about tech. And it was so complicated that I was nervous after looking at it that lawyers would either A, stop watching or get done watching and be so scared that they would quit the practice of law. So I did it again. I was too lazy to bring my glasses with me or to put my contacts in. And I just sort of guessed which, I'm gonna share a screen, I guessed which slides were up as I was speaking. And I was wrong. And I was actually two or three slides off when I watched it, which I sure would have been annoying. Then I did it a third time. Didn't get too far into it though. FedEx shows up to bring my new running shoes. And it happens to be a guy I went to college with. He just starts yelling to me from the driveway and it totally messed it all up. Anyway, I'm back. Hopefully it works this time. And we might as well just uh, get started instead of just having me ramble along. So today's topic is legal ethics and professional responsibilities, professional responsibility, the issues uh, regarding client data and working remotely. So this is uh, tied to the pandemic in that we're all working remotely right now. Last week, Pennsylvania, uh, the Bar Associations in Pennsylvania's Committee on Legal Ethics and Professional Responsibility issued this opinion, ethical obligations for lawyers working remotely. I think it's a great opinion. It has some great ideas, thoughts, reminders on data security. I'd recommend reading it. It's much more in depth than this presentation is going to be. This is really a, a very basic version of data security. And as I'm gonna mention at the end, I think the opinion is especially valuable in that it, I think it applies beyond the context in which it was issued. And I'll explain that later. So today, these are the rules that we're gonna focus on. Remember, when you're working remotely and talking about client data that you access remotely, all of the rules apply. Just like in any other CLE I, I do, whether it's for family lawyers, whether it's for criminal defense lawyers, all the rules apply all the time but some rules come up more often than not in particular uh, practice areas and subject matter areas. This is one of them. When we start talking about uh, the subject matter area of legal ethics, client data, working remotely. The rules we're gonna discuss today, or at least mention today, rule 1.1, that's the rule that requires lawyers to provide competent representation. Rule 1.6, that's the rule that prohibits lawyers from revealing information relating to the representation of a client, the confidentiality rule. Rule 5.1 and 5.3, those are rules a lot of, I don't talk about often. Those rule, two rules apply to lawyers who have a supervisory role within an office or firm. Uh, the first 5.1 applies when a lawyer is supervising lawyers. Uh, the second, 5.3, applies when the supervisor is supervising non-lawyers, the, the non-lawyer staff. Essentially, the duties imposed by those rules are that the supervising lawyer has to ensure that those being supervised are conducting themselves in such a way as to comply with the obligations that the supervising lawyer owes under the rules of professional conduct. Rule 5.2 is the sort of the reverse of rule 5.1. It applies to the lawyer who is being supervised by another lawyer. I'm mentioning it right now because uh, when we talk about tech, it's not uncommon for the lawyer who is being supervised to be um, better at tech than the supervising lawyer. Um, don't forget that if you're being supervised by a lawyer who um, is inept or incompetent when it comes to technology, and who has, for today's purposes, set up a virtual office that puts client data at risk that does not excuse you of your professional obligations. 
The comments to those rules are, are relevant and important today. Uh, comment eight to rule 1.1 reminds us that competence includes tech competence. The court adopted that comment a couple years ago. And tech competence means that lawyers uh, have an understanding of the risks and benefits of relevant technology, both on their law practices, on the delivery of legal services, and on client matters. Rule 1.6, the confidentiality rule, comment 16, no matter where you store client data, you have to act competently to protect it. Now, whether it's stored in a file cabinet in your office or whether it's stored electronically in the cloud. Again, uh, comment 17 to rule 1.6, when transmitting client information, lawyer has to take reasonable precautions to prevent it from coming into the hands of unintended recipients. That applies as well when transmitting uh, client information electronically. Here's the duty in a nutshell. A lawyer has a duty to take reasonable precautions to protect against the inadvertent disclosure of or unauthorized access to information relating to the representation of a client. And as I'm going to mention later in this presentation, this applies no matter where you're storing the client information, no matter how you're transmitting it. Now, I wanna talk about authorized access. Well, wait a minute, Mike, didn't you just say that the duty is to protect against unauthorized access? Yes, I did, but I wanna mention authorized access, and here's why. Here's some language from the Pennsylvania opinion. When forced to work remotely, attorneys remain obligated to take reasonable precautions so that they are able to access client data and provide information to the client or others, such as courts and opposing counsel. That's the same in Vermont. 10 years ago, the VBA's Professional Responsibility Committee issued uh, Advisory Opinion 2010-6, and here's the digest, the summary. Yes, you can store information in the cloud, as long as you take reasonable precautions to protect the confidentiality of the information and to ensure access to those materials. So basically, if you've set up a virtual office and you can't get your stuff, your client's information, that's a problem. So I'm glad the Pennsylvania opinion pointed it out because it's more than just protecting client information. It's making sure you can access it uh, so you can do your job. A couple of general thoughts that the uh, Pennsylvania opinion discusses, mentions before you really get to the tech stuff, and I think they're great and they're important. Don't forget paper. You know, here's what they say, working from home. You may be required to bring paper files and other client-related documents into your home or wherever re remote location you're working. When you do, make reasonable efforts to ensure that household residents or visitors, who has visitors right now, are not, who are not associated with your law practice don't have access to those items. Essentially, don't leave your stuff laying around. Also, don't forget phone calls. Pennsylvania Opinion mentions this as well. When speaking on a phone or, on, or having an online or other conference, try to find a dedicated or private area where you can communicate privately with your clients. In other words, take reasonable precautions to assure that others aren't present and listening. That makes me think to say this, your relatives and roommates, for the most part, are not your coworkers. Don't be talking about client matters around them. And then I love these general thoughts they threw in that don't forget about paper, don't forget about phone conversations, because in Vermont anyway, it hasn't been you know, encrypted email or client data in the cloud that has uh, landed lawyers in hot water when it comes to improperly disclosing or failing to protect client information. It's been the little stuff. For instance, uh, leaving a client file in the hallway. The lawyer had been terminated, client wanted the file back, Lawyer says, okay, uh, you can come get it. Lawyer left, locked the door, leaves the client file in a box outside in a shared hallway, other offices, in a bigger building with even more offices. Uh, hearing panel of the PRB said that's a violation of the rule. That's not reasonable. Um, similarly, a lawyer sold a work computer. No big deal. However, forget to take the hard drive out. The person who bought it had access to all the client information. So remember, it's the little things that tend to, uh, or at least in Vermont, have resulted in the disclosure of client uh, 
information that should otherwise be protected. Okay, so the duty is to take reasonable precautions. So what are, what are reasonable precautions? Uh, a couple of years ago, the ABA issues for, issued formal opinion 477, and they said this, what constitutes reasonable efforts, so reasonable precautions, is not susceptible to a hard and fast rule, but rather is contingent upon a set of factors. Essentially what the ABA did is say, we're not going to require regulators or bar associations or advisory or, you know, these advisory ethics committees to set and define the specific safety measures that lawyers have to take. Encryption is an example. A lot of people always want to know, do I have to encrypt email? I don't know. All I know is this, you've got to take a reasonable, you've got to take reasonable precautions to make sure that client information doesn't go to somebody who isn't supposed to go to and isn't accessed by somebody who's not supposed to have access. Whether that means you have to encrypt your email, that's up to you to decide, okay? And the ABA agreed. Instead, what the ABA says is lawyers need to adopt and law firms a process by which they will assess the risks associated with storing or transmitting client information in any medium or form, identify and implement the appropriate security measures in response to that risk, make sure they've been implemented, and then make sure that they've, they're updated. You know, what's reasonable today might not be reasonable down the road. You're gonna have to update. Email and encryption is a great example of that. In 97 or 98, the VBA issued an advisory ethics opinion that said, no, you don't have to encrypt email. It's too expensive, it's too hard for the client then to be able to access the email you send. Nowadays, I'm not so sure that's still the standard when it comes to reasonableness and precautions. I don't think it's as unreasonable anymore to expect uh, email to be encrypted. So when it comes to risk assessment, well, we're not gonna say, yes, this is okay. No, that's not okay. We're gonna say, you have to exercise reasonable precautions. A lot of the questions that you ask, wherever you're storing information or when you're transmitting information, they're the same over time. So for instance, we've got the store all facility and we've got a place to uh, cloud storage. Here are the questions you might've asked of the person who owned the store all facility. Is there a gate? Do you lock it? Who can unlock it? Who has the code? Does my unit have a lock? Does anybody else have a key to the lock on my unit? Are you gonna go into my unit? Can I get into my unit whenever I want to, or are you only open certain hours? What happens if I don't pay? Are you gonna give me my files back, or are you gonna shred them? You know, cloud storage, cloud vendor, same thing. Passwords, that's like a gate. Is there multi-factor authentication? Uh, if somebody hacks in, are you gonna let me know if there's been a breach? Just like with the store all facility. Hey, if somebody goes into my unit, are you gonna tell me? Do you encrypt it? Is it backed up? Like if you fail, is my information still gonna be available? Can I access it whenever I want to? What if I stop paying or wanna go somewhere else? Are you gonna keep a copy of my client data? So the questions over time don't really change when it comes to, the measures that you want to know whether people are taking to protect your client information. Now, even though I don't really say, yes, you should do this, no, you shouldn't do that, I keep it real general, take reasonable, reasonable precautions, the Pennsylvania opinion gives some answers. And they say that here are, here are some things that we consider to be reasonable precautions. And I think by saying that, although I don't want to speak for them, they, they're sort of saying, if you don't do these things, you haven't taken reasonable precautions. Here's one, avoid public internet and free Wi-Fi. Completely agree, Kevin, Ryan, and I used to talk about, you know, if you're sitting in the coffee shop, you probably shouldn't be using the coffee shop's Wi-Fi to uh, conduct client business. I'd add, uh, avoid shared Wi-Fi. You know, I used to have a neighbor who kept asking me to chip in to his Wi-Fi bill, uh, you know, um, internet bill, so we could share and reduce the cost. Some of you might be doing that. Um, again, it might, it might extend access to client information that to people who you should not have access to client information. Similarly, shared devices. You know, I've got a friend whose spouse and he can see each other's text messages and emails. Um, 
from different devices in different rooms. Probably not a great idea to have someone else in your family or home have a device that can access your confidential information. Set up a VPN. I think that makes complete sense. Uh, the state was, you know, I have one set up here so I can access the, the work network. Uh, Pennsylvania also says, uh, you know, multi-factor authentication is a reasonable precaution. I agree, I've got the Authenticator app, it's super easy to use, it's a way to prove your identity, that you are who you say you are when you're trying to access information stored electronically. Strong passwords, good reminder from Pennsylvania's Bar Association. Kevin Ryan, Jim Knapp always point out lawyers are notorious for poor passwords. The Pennsylvania opinion suggest that the longer and more complex the better although it does acknowledge that there's some debate about that from my experts another good little tip from the pennsylvania bar association does your screen lock how quickly do you have your phone or your ipad set up to lock if you're not using it that's important if you get up and start walking around get distracted whatever somebody else comes along can they see the information that that is on your device another tip uh the pennsylvania considers uh to be a reasonable precaution and that is to follow the FBI's recommendations when it comes to virtual meeting security. They're on this page. Uh, at the end of March, I think it was March 30th, the FBI issued, a, I think it was the Boston office, issued warnings when it comes, to, in, in response to concerns about Zoom. Now these tips are great they apply much beyond zoom to any platform that hosts virtual meetings these are some things that you should remember you know does it do you need a password to get in um don't share the link to the meeting publicly when it's just going to be a meeting between you and a client um, does your client understand the screen sharing options do you understand how screen sharing works are you sharing stuff on the screen with an entire meeting full of people Really simple stuff that people might overlook, but just take a look at the list that the FBI put out. Leave it on the screen for just a second. Although I suppose you could hit pause or rewind, so I won't. Good tip in the uh, ethics opinion from Pennsylvania. Back up any data that you're stored that is stored remotely. Are you backing it up? You know, when we're at work, we get used to automatic backups. That might not be the case at home. You know, I had to take a little test. Um, like a tech test that they're making all the employees of the judiciary take. And one of the examples in there was the, the person who's working at home, work policy is that there won't be any data stored anywhere but a work approved device. And the little hypo they give you, this person stores, uh, you know, can't find the work approved device, forgot it at the office or something. So uses a personal device and figures no big deal. Uh, the meeting's tomorrow morning, I'll just put it on there and then I'll go to my meeting. So does that, and of course in the hypo, they wanna make it as extreme as possible, but this could happen. Stores it on a personal hard drive, the car gets broken into that night, uh, the computer gets stolen, there's no backup, so you're absent data. Another tip, secure all your devices. The Pennsylvania opinion links to Microsoft recommendations. They're all pretty basic. I'll just use them right there. Um, you know, I don't know if you're, if you're using a personal device at home, is the soft, the, for instance, any malware software up to date, any virus software up to date, and then just other good common sense tips. Um, one I hadn't thought of that's in the Pennsylvania opinion. They consider it a reasonable precaution that when you're working remotely, only visit websites that have enhanced security. And for those of you who don't know what it means, uh, look for the S at the end of the HTTP, uh, more secure than the standard HTTP. Um, read the opinion or you know, go online and do a search if you wanna get really dive deep into that. But um, I thought that was an interesting inclusion in the the uh, Pennsylvania ethics opinion. So here's the list of the what the Pennsylvania Bar Association considers to be reasonable precautions when working from home and accessing client data from home. Quick timeout before we move on. Um, this is Doc Rivers, former Celtics coach, current coach of the Clippers, calling a timeout in a basketball game. Kind of how I looked when I used to call timeouts, usually unhappy and agitated. 
But here's a scenario I want to talk to you about during the timeout. You're at a VBA meeting and you're chatting with a vendor. And you ask the vendor, will my data be encrypted in transmission and at rest? And the vendor replies, yes. In transmission, we use a BTTF flux capacitor. At rest, we use the latest, most updated Romulan cloaking device. You respond, sign me up. Okay, if that's you, when the timeout ends, you're staying on the bench. You're not going back into the game. The BTTF flux capacitor is what Doc Brown used to travel through time in the DeLorean. Uh, the Romulan cloaking device, that's technology from Star Trek. There's Captain Kirk. So this is no different. If you answered, yeah, I'll do that. Then me, when I called timeout, saying to one of my players, Hey, hey, Jimmy, I want you to go out there and file a motion for summary judgment. Okay, coach, I'm ready. Boom. Uh, no, you're not ready, Jimmy. Stay on the bench. It's okay, however, if that is you. It's okay not to know everything. But you have to know what you don't know. And acting confidently to safeguard client information includes knowing what you don't know and consulting with people who do, whether that's someone else on staff or an IT professional. Just wanted to throw that in. It's also referenced in the uh, Pennsylvania opinion. Remember, working remotely, take reasonable precautions to safeguard client data. Here's why I think, you know, sort of end on this, the Pennsylvania opinion is much more valuable than just the context in which it, in which it was issued and its title. Ethical obligations when working remotely, when it comes to safeguarding client data, are no different than when working in the office. It's are we taking reasonable, reasonable precautions to prevent protect against unauthorized access to inadvertent disclosure of uh, information that should be protected. Ethical obligations when working remotely during the pandemic are no different now than they were a year ago or than they will be a year from now. The duty will be the same. Take reasonable precautions to safeguard client data. Yes, we're facing new challenges right now, and those challenges are informing what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but they do not change our duties. So that's why I really like the Pennsylvania Bar Association's opinion as a perfect tool for right now, but also as a good reminder for protecting client data moving forward if you choose, hey, this is working for me. I like working remotely. And then finally, I love the way the Pennsylvania opinion ended, had nothing to do with client data or technology or reasonable precautions or inadvertent disclosure or unauthorized access. It said, hey, remember, working remotely, stay civil. Remember your obligation of civility, one of the seven C's of ethics. It says right in the opinion, it quotes from an LA Bar Association opinion. Right now, we should be liberally exercising professional courtesies. Could not agree more. As I blogged a couple weeks ago, civility matters. It always has, in my opinion, especially now. Anyway, that's the end. Um, if you'd like the, the slide sent to you or the Pennsylvania opinion sent to you, there's my email address. Uh, just get in touch with me and I'll, I'll get it over to you. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. Hope you stay well. I got the new shoes ready to go. Check them out. Probably be really fast now in my new shoes. I'm gonna go for a run right now. The sun's out. Hope you all have a great rest of the day. And uh, until the next time, in the garage. Take care.